Hi, everybody. Welcome to your second video lecture. Uh, this is video lecture on topic 1.2, which is the production possibilities curve. I'm currently in the Shia closet. I imagine many of our videos are going to be in here uh, because I'm not allowed in my classroom. So this is the world we live in right now. Um, so my goal is to keep this under 20 minutes. So let's get to it. Uh, so we were talking about production possibilities, and it actually is exactly what it sounds like. Any nation only has a certain allocation of resources, and that allocation enables us to produce a certain quantity of goods. But nations can't produce an unlimited quantity of goods because of, you got it, scarcity. We can't do it. So what we're going to be looking at today is if we employ all of our resources to production of goods, how many can we actually produce? Now, again, these are fictional numbers that we're using here. It's all just to demonstrate a logical concept, the idea that there is a limit to what we can produce. And in order to make production, or as a result, we have to make production choices, which have costs. So it's that same logic, but put into a graph. So let's take a look at it here. Uh, this is a production possibilities table, and then we'll get to the graph here in a second, or the curve, as we call it. So the production possibilities table here shows us five points, A, B, C, D, and E. And each of these points show a different production combination that this nation, because we're looking at a nation here, can produce if they employ all of their resources, all of them, right? They are fully employed, in other words. That means every piece of land that we have is being used, every capital or labor assist is being used, every laborer is employed, and every entrepreneur is busy solving the problems of the world, right? If we're employing all of the reso those resources, this is what we can produce. Now, because we are dealing in a two-dimensional graph, we can only use two uh, variables at a time. So we're only going to look at the production of two goods, not the millions of goods that can be produced. Okay, so our first good is bikes and our second good is computers. You can see that here on the, uh, what would you call that, left, I guess, of the table. And in point A, notice if we put all of our resources towards production, at point A, we can produce 14 bicycles and zero computers, right? So if we employ all of our resources towards producing bikes, we can make 14 of those bicycles as a nation. That is our limit. We cannot produce 15. If we produce 13, then we are not producing at full capacity, which means people are unemployed, land is laying vacant, factories are empty. Make sense? Point B, at point B, if I decide, you know what, I want some computers, I'm going to produce 12 bicycles and two computers. If I'm producing two more computers, that means I'm losing two bikes. In other words, to choose to produce two more computers, the cost, choice has a cost, right? The cost is two bicycles. Catch that? So when I went from A to B, I chose two more computers. The cost, I lost two bicycles. Okay. When I'm going from B to C, I am now going from two to four computers. So I'm choosing to produce two more computers. The cost of that is I'm going from 12 to nine bicycles. So I'm losing three bicycles. Again, that is full employment there at point C. I can produce nine bikes and four computers. If I produce 10 bikes and six computers, I'm beyond my production possibilities. In other words, it's impossible. It's unattainable. I can't produce that much. I just don't have the resources to do it. If I produce, say, seven bikes and two computers, then I'm under my possibilities. I'm not fully employed. People don't have jobs. Factories are empty. Land is vacant. Entrepreneurs aren't, do aren't solving problems. Okay, D again, five and six computers. And then E, if I'm producing only computers, A, to go from D to E, I put, produce two more computers. And I lost, notice five. I went from five bikes to zero bikes, so my cost was five bicycles. Notice that as I increase my specialization towards computers, as I produce exclusively computers, I lost more and more bikes. We'll talk about more of that in a second. So that's the chart, right? Anytime we look at a graph, it is actually made up of points on a chart. Those points are then plotted out on an X and Y axis, which creates our curve and gives us our graph. So we're looking at the data behind the graph. All right, let's keep going. Maybe it'll work for me. 
So if I put this in a graph, I have an X and Y axis. You can draw, just draw this L. We're going to label the Y axis bikes. We're going to label the X axis computers. If you don't remember Y and X axis, the way I always remember it is Y to the sky, right? The Y is always pointing up, the Y to the sky, and the X is on the ground. So there you go. Uh, I plot my first point. Remember, if I produce only bicycles, I can produce 14 bicycles and zero computers. So that's on the Y axis there. I plot my second point and producing 12 bikes and two computers, four computers and eight bikes. I'm producing eight computers and six bikes, and then 10 computers and zero bikes, right? So I put all of those points on. When I put those points together, it creates a curve. Connect the dots. This is our production possibilities curve. Looks just like this. In fact, you can draw very quickly by just drawing the L and then drawing this bowed out curve here. This bowed out curve demonstrates a few things. First, it demonstrates scarcity. Notice that I cannot produce beyond this, right? I can't produce way outside of this. I can't produce, for example, 16 bicycles and zero computers because that would be a point way up here. Can't do it. Um, here, let me get a pen here. I can't produce a point way out here because it's beyond my, my productive capacities. I just can't do it. I don't have the resources to do it. So it demonstrates that we have a limited, limited amount that we can produce as a nation. Scarcity, right? Now, in addition to this, it shows opportunity costs. As I produce more computers, go from zero to two, I lose bicycles, right? So every choice has a cost. When I choose more computers, my cost is I'm giving up the production of bicycles. And then finally, it shows efficiency, right? Notice any point on this curve, I am fully utilizing all of my resources. We call that efficient. So every point on the curve is efficient because everyone who wants a job has a job. Every piece of land that can be used for production is being used for production. Every tool, every factory is being used for production. And every entrepreneur is busy solving the problems of the world. We are efficient when we're producing at full capacity. We don't want leftover resources. If we are ever inside of the curve, we consider that inefficient. It means we could have produced on the curve, but instead we are producing inside of the curve, right? So instead we have a point like this. Oh, I got out of control. Point F. Can I produce point F? Absolutely, right? That's like eight and one computer, eight bikes and one computer. I can produce that, no problem, right? But I am completely inefficient. I have people that are unemployed. I have land that's laying dormant. I have factories that are empty. I have entrepreneurs that aren't solving problems. My resources are not fully being utilized. So any point inside of the curve is considered inefficient, and we call that unemployment. So right now, you know something about our current unemployment rate in the United States. It's not good. So where are we at on our production possibilities curve? We are certainly inside of the curve. Right? This is called a market failure. We're not producing what we actually should be producing. Okay. It's also, and I just said that, anything on the curve is efficient. What about this point out here? What do we call this? Well, we call that unattainable. Given our current resources, we cannot attain that point. We cannot produce that combination. We just don't have enough resources to do it. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video and see if you can calculate the opportunity cost of these different items, and I'll go over it. Okay, did you do it? If not, pause. Try it. Uh, if so, let's get into it. Here we go. Uh, what is the opportunity cost of moving from A to B? So the first question you have to ask is, what choice are we making? So if we are moving from A to B, what choice are we making? We are making the choice to produce more computers. So we're going from zero computers to two computers. What did that cost us here? I gotta move my face somewhere else, there we go. So we went from A to B, what did that cost us? Well, we went from zero to two computers and we went from 14 to 12 bicycles. So the opportunity cost of this is two bikes. What about the next one? What is the opportunity cost of moving from B to D, let me get a different color here so we can tell them apart. So we're going from B all the way to D. What's our opportunity cost? So what choice did I make? The choice I made was to produce more computers. How many more? I'm going from two to six computers. 
What did that cost me? Well, I went from 12 all the way down to six bicycles. So to produce four more computers, my opportunity cost, the next best alternative, the thing I gave up is 12 to six bikes. So I lost six bicycles. Okay, what is the opportunity cost of going from D to B? So let's flip it around, purple. First question is, what, are, what choice are you making? So I'm going from B to D. What choice am I making? I'm choosing to produce more bicycles. I'm choosing to go from six bicycles to 12 bicycles. What did I give up when I made the choice to go from B to D in my production? Well, I must be giving up computers. How many computers? Well, I went from producing six computers to only producing two. So I have given up four computers. What is the opportunity cost of moving from F to C? Let's check it out. I'm going from F, let's change colors here, make it easier to follow. All right, I'm going from F to C, straight up, right there. What's my opportunity cost? First, what was my choice? Well, my choice was to go from uh, six bicycles to, what's that, uh, nine bicycles? I went from six bicycles to nine. So my choice is I want more bicycles. So I must be giving up computers, right? If I choose bicycles, I'm giving up computers. So how many computers I give up? I went from F to C, so I'm from four to four. I didn't give up any computers. Why? Because notice point F is inside of the curve. This is an unemployed or inefficient production combination, point F. So I can go from F to C and it doesn't cost me anything because I can get to that production point by simply taking my empty factories and activating them. My unemployed workers and putting them to work. My entrepreneurs who aren't solving problems and having them solve problems, right? I re-employ these resources and as a result, I can go from F to C without an opportunity cost. Okay, hopefully that made some sense. Uh, what can we say? So that's zero. I didn't lose any computers. What can we say about point G way out here? That's right. It's unattainable, right? We cannot reach it given our current resources because of scarcity. We only have so many resources. All right. Hopefully that made some sense for you. Let's keep going. Oh, forgot I have the animation. All right. Well, let's try something else here. So we got pizza. We got robots. Um, and in our pizza and robots here, notice that we are producing two different products, but the same thing, same analysis can be applied. This is just like our graph, just like our previous chart with bicycles and computers. If I produce a point A, I can produce 20 pizzas and zero robots. Point B, 19 pizzas, one robot. Remember, if I'm producing a side of this curve or less than these combinations, it's inefficient and I can't produce outside of these combinations, right? So. What is the opportunity cost as I go from zero robots to four robots? Let's take a look at that. So if I go to from zero to one robot, how many pizzas did I give up? You got it, one. I went from 20 pizzas to 19 pizzas, so I only gave up one. When I went from one to two, how many pizzas did I give up? Three. I went from 19 to 16. When I choose to go from C to D, again, only one more robot here, one, one, and one, that's constant. How many pizzas did I give up? Well, I went from 16 to 10, so six. And then when I went from three to four, how many pizzas did I give up? Well, I went from 10 to zero, so I gave up 10. What is true about opportunity costs here? It's increasing. As I specialize more and more in the production of a single good, there you go, then the opportunity cost or the foregone production of the other good will increase. That's your definition of the law of increasing opportunity costs. As I specialize more and more in the production of good, I will have to give up more and more of the other good. Why? The reason why is that the resources are not easily interchangeable or adaptable, right? The resources I use to make pizza are very different than the resources I use to make robots. So as I am going from zero robots to four robots, I'm now taking resources, people who are trained chefs, and I'm having to make robots. And so I'm going to need more of those trained chefs to make that fourth robot. It's going to take more of them. I'm going to take pizza shops, and I'm going to convert them into factories to make robots. I'm going to take ovens, and I'm going to convert those ovens so that they are used to help me make robots, right? 
So it costs more when I'm taking things that are designed to produce something else, resources designed to produce something else, and retraining them and retooling them to produce only robots. Because remember, at point E, I'm producing four robots, zero pizza. That means every single resource in my entire nation is being used to produce robots. Okay, so because resources are interchangeable, it's going to cost more as I specialize in that production. We'll come back to that time and time again. Students have trouble with this concept, so we'll spend a little bit more time on it. But the really important thing to notice is that this law is the reason the curve is bowed out or concave. It's the reason the curve goes like that. Whenever you see a bowed out curve, you know you have increasing opportunity costs because resources are not interchangeable, right? So if I were to plot these points, those points would come together. Oops, how did that happen? Oh, I moved on, that's what happened, there we go. <laughs> there we go. They would, if I plotted those points, it would create a curve like this, indicating increasing opportunity costs. Okay, let's keep going. What about calzones and pizza? First of all, notice that these are very interrelated goods, right? If you can make pizza, you can make calzones. A calzone is basically a folded over pizza. Same ingredients, same resources being used for just about every single variant of calzones and pizzas. So with that in mind, let's do that calculation of opportunity costs again. So when I'm choosing to produce my first pizza, I'm losing how many calzones? Well, I went from four to three, so you lose one. When I produce one more pizza, I go from three to two calzones, so I lose one. When I go from point C to point D, I go from two to three pizzas, so I go from two to one calzone, I lose one calzone. And then when I go to four, I go from one to zero calzone, so I lose one calzone. Notice opportunity cost is constant, right? Oh, constant. <laughs> constant right because the resources are interchangeable it doesn't cost me more as i'm specializing more and more in the production of pizza because all of my resources are already trained to produce pizza right and now they can be converted over to calzones with relatively little changing retooling retraining needed so as a result these are easily adaptable resources for the production of two goods Constant opportunity costs will look like a straight line. It's not common. Not a single nation in the world has constant opportunity costs, but you need to understand it. So if you ever see a production possibilities curve that looks like this, instead of bowed out, you know that those are constant opportunity costs, which means the resources are interchangeable. Common ones that you see here are coin, corn and soybeans. Right? The farming of those two things are interchangeable. Those resources are interchangeable. So they have constant opportunity costs. Hopefully that makes sense. Again, students have trouble with this concept, so we'll do it a few more times in the future. Okay, let's take a look here. Constant versus increasing. So we have corn and wheat. We have cactus and pineapples. Which of these do you think would be constant, and which means a straight line, and which would be bowed out, which means a concave line or bowed out? Okay, hopefully you answered that corn and wheat have interchangeable resources. Think about it. They both use the same machinery, the same skill set for the laborers, um, the same resources to be produced, same type of land, all of that stuff. So it's going to have constant opportunity costs, that straight line there. And we notice as we move and choose more and more wheat, our opportunity cost is going to be constant. What about cactus and pineapples? Well, those do not have interchangeable resources. Cactus and pineapples use very different types of land. Cactus grows in the desert, pineapple grows in the jungle or in a tropical climate, right? So they do not have interchangeable resources. So as I produce more pineapples, I'm going to lose more and more cacti as a result, which means my opportunity cost is increasing. It looks like this. When I produce my first pineapple, very little opportunity cost. But when I produce my final, where I'm specializing in all pineapples, I'm taking resources designed for the production of cacti, and I'm using them to produce pineapples. Okay? All right, let's keep going. Now, what about shifts in the production possibilities curve? Do shifts exist? Absolutely, they do. What causes a shift? 
there are three of the shifters of the production possibilities curve. How can we produce more with our current allocation of resources? Here we go. The first is if we find new resources, right? So maybe we're digging and we strike oil that we didn't know was there anymore. We have new allocation of resources. Our curve is going to shift outward because we can produce more now because we have more resources. Or maybe we have a mass immigration into the United States, a bunch of new people. That means our labor has increased. And that's going to shift our curve outward because now we can produce more because we have more laborers, right? Uh, and vice versa. They can go down as well. Maybe there's a natural disaster and we lose land. Land is no longer usable. If that's true, then we'll see a shrinkage in our economy and it will shift inward. And I'll show you that in a second. Resource quality, right? Sometimes we have like a nuclear wasteland that has unusable land. And then we have workers come in and clean it. And eventually it's a much better quality. And now we can use those resources to produce again. Awesome. We're going to see a shift outward in our curve. Uh, also, labor can be increased in quality through education. If I educate my workforce, they can become better. And as a result, it can shift outward. Uh, oftentimes, capital goods machinery gets improved. It's more efficient. And now my curve will shift outward. I can do more with the same amount of resources. So quantity, quality, and then finally, a change in technology. If we have new technological innovation, we always assume it's a good thing, and that will shift our curve outward. Tech makes us more productive. When we're more productive with the same resources, we now have economic growth, we call it, as a production possibilities curve shifts out. Okay, keep that in mind. Let's try this a couple of times. We have computers, we have pizza. Notice it's bowed out. What's true about its opportunity costs? That's right, they are increasing. Now, computers and pizza, not interchangeable resources. If there's an increase in population, what's gonna happen? Well, if the population increases, that's an increase in the quantity of our resources. That means we can produce more, both computers and pizzas. So we're gonna have to see this shift outward or to the right. And now things that used to be unattainable can now be attainable. All right, what if we have new technology for pizza ovens, just pizza ovens, what's gonna happen? Well, we're gonna see an increase in the production of pizzas. It's not really gonna impact computers at all, so we'll see this lopsided increase, right? We can produce more pizzas, but the same amount of computers, a lopsided shift. All right, final thing that we need to go over, capital goods versus future growth. Now, remember, we said we can produce two types of goods, capital and consumer goods. So most of the time when you see this, you're going to see uh, nations. And when you see nations, you'll see capital and consumer goods as our X and Y axis. Now, remember, in the event that I'm producing capital goods, I'm actually producing a resource. Think about it, right? What are our resources? Land, labor, capital, entrepreneurial ability. So when I produce capital goods, I'm increasing the quantity of my resources. When I increase the quantity of my resources, I have economic growth. So let's take a look at this. Panama favors consumer goods. What's going to happen in Panama if they pr prefer consumer goods? Notice they produce a lot of consumer goods, few capital goods at this point. Well, they're going to have some economic growth, sure. And so it will shift outward because they do have some capital goods that they're producing. Let's take a look at Mexico. Mexico produces a lot more capital goods, very few consumer goods. What's going to happen? Well, they're going to have a lot of growth. Why? Because they're producing a lot of capital goods. And we know capital goods production increases the quantity of the resource of capital, which increases our productivity, which shifts our curve outward and causes huge economic growth. The big takeaway there is when nations produce more capital goods, they experience more future growth. They might say, why wouldn't every nation do that? Well, not every nation needs it, right? Panama might be having trouble just feeding their population. So they shouldn't be making all this tech. They should make more consumer goods to feed their people. So needs are always, always different. So countries that produce more capital goods will have more growth in the future. Make sure you write that down. Okay, production, possibilities, curve, and efficiency. There are two types of efficiency. You can write these down. There is allocative efficiency and productive efficiency. Productive efficiency is just, I'm producing items in the least costly way. Everything is being employed. So productive efficiency is any point on the curve. It's considered productively efficient. You're using all of your resources. Allocative efficiency is a little bit different. It means that I am producing what people want. 
what's desired by society. It's an optimal point. So there's only one point on the curve that is actually allocatively efficient. Okay, so what points are productively efficient here? Okay, if you answered A, B, C, and D, you're correct, right? Any point on the curve is considered productively efficient because I am producing using all of my resources. So anything on the curve, productively efficient. What about allocative efficiency? We actually don't know. We need more information. We don't know what society wants based on this graph. But what if this nation had no electricity? What would be allocatively efficient? Well, yeah, bicycles, right? They have no need for computers if they have no electricity. So they will probably produce only bicycles. So the allocatively efficient point would actually be point A, right? Because that's what the nation will want and need. Let's take a look here. Uh, we have size 20 running shoes versus size 10 running shoes. What's going on here? Is combination A efficient? Well, combination A, I'm producing a lot of size 20 running shoes, very few size 10 running shoes. Is it productively efficient? Well, is it on the curve? Yes. It's on the curve, productively efficient. Is that allocatively efficient? Probably not because most people do not have size 20 feet. So I'm producing all these things that society doesn't want. So yes, it's productively efficient, but my guess is that it's not allocatively efficient as a result. Bonus round, notice it's a straight curve. If it's a straight curve, what kind of opportunity cost do we have? Constant. Yes, because the same resources used to produce size 10 running shoes are used to produce size 20 running shoes. That's it for production possibilities curve. It's a big concept, a big mastery concept. Uh, try it out, Khan Academy 1.2, opportunity costs in the PPC. All right, thank you so much. Talk to you guys later.